Agna, as you can see from the Science Council. Um, as I said, I'm going to have to rush through a few bits because uh, we're running a bit late. Um, Science Council, though. Everyone's heard of Science Council? Kind of. Just very briefly. Um, we are an umbrella organisation and our members are professional bodies like ORS, RSB, RSC, all these big, uh, big names. Um, we've been around for about 12 years now um, and uh, we've introduced Chartered Scientist uh, as a sort of unifying standard uh, across all disciplines, across all sciences. Um, because previously, even now, to some degree, you know, biologists are looked down upon uh, uh, by chemists, and chemists might be looked down upon by physicists, and there's sort of uh, friendly, sometimes also friendly rivalry going on. And um, some charters uh, are, uh, you know, have one standard, other charters might have a different standard. So there's no real way of telling what charter you know what, what it actually means so some charters you might get just by paying your membership other charters you will have to complete uh, really long competence reports to prove that you are at that level so it's really hard to tell what it actually means so chartered scientists is meant to sort of have this one standard that applies to all scientists across all disciplines so you can still be a chemist you can still be a physicist if you are a chartered scientist, it means that you're working at that particular level that's set by the Science Council. Um, we've introduced two other levels for people who might not be at the chartered level yet, uh, and I'm going to briefly touch upon that as well um, as we go along. Uh, so, why should you become registered? I mean, it's quite self-explanatory to me, at least. It proves that you are at that particular level, that you're working at that standard. Um, and the, the, the basis of professional registration with the Science Council um, uh, via your chosen professional body is that you keep up with your CPD, with your continuous professional development. So when you're looking for new employment, if you are looking for a promotion, if you want to be a part of the wider sort of society, uh, science society, um, that, that's what it very much does. Uh, being registered it includes you to that group of people who, who have committed to their professional development and who want to go and achieve uh, something uh, you know, as they go along in their careers. Um, so this is uh, what we call a um, competence matrix. Uh, as I said, we have two other levels uh, of registration for people who might not yet be at the chartered level, because chartered level is the highest level. It's usually for managers and team leaders people who have responsibilities, not just for themselves, but for you know, a larger group of people who implement policies. So the other two levels are for registered science technician is for usually for people at the beginning of their careers when they first start their jobs. Uh, they work with su supervision. Um, they, uh, they don't necessarily make uh, their own decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, but they're still learning, they're still sort of uh, um, doing what they, they, they were employed to do, uh, but they might not be as far along as, as, as others. So, so in between level is registered scientist and ORS have just applied to, for a license uh, to award RSI as well. So for those people who are not at seaside level yet, RSI will be the perfect option because, um, so for RSI level we look for someone who they can make their own decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. They're still supervised by someone, um, but they have a fair amount of autonomy and a fair amount of responsibility, uh, but they're not necessarily managing teams yet. They're not implementing solutions. They might offer solutions, they might offer advice, uh, but they're not necessarily the people who are actually going and implementing and you know managing all, all these things. Um, right, and as I said before, um, for us, it's not about a degree, it's not about your certificates, it's about how you apply your knowledge, your scientific, technical knowledge in your workplace. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to have a degree. Um, as we say, you might have gotten your PhD 50 years ago, uh, but does that mean that you're still at that level? Uh, it just proves that you were at that level at some time, you know, some time ago, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you still work at that particular level. So. Um, 
these registers are quite a good way of proving that you are working to a certain standard set, set by the Science Council. Um, and it's all about explaining how you apply your knowledge in the workplace. So, so very simple, sometimes very simple examples will do. Uh, for chartered scientists, broader examples, of, um, I'm going to talk about it a bit later on. And as I said, to keep any of these registers, to keep any of those registrations, you will have to continue to um, keep up with your CPD. Um, and CPD for us, for Science Council, we don't ask for hours, we don't ask for points. Um, and it can be pretty much anything, as long as you can reflect back on the activity and explain how it helped you, um, and how it helped to do your work better, how it, helped the, how it might help you to help the society a bit better. Um, so it can be anything from like reading an article and it triggers something in your mind and you approach your research, approach your job in a different way. Um, it can be shadowing a colleague um, and learning something new from them. You might be teaching a colleague something that they didn't know before. You might be mentoring someone. It might be something outside that you do. Out, um, something you do outside work. Uh, for example, being a STEM ambassador. Um, you know, going and talking to people, uh, to students, schools, and uh, promoting STEM disciplines. Uh, again, that's part of your CPD. Um, for chartered scientists, obviously, you will have to go to all the big conferences and keep up to date with what's happening in the broader field. And um, just, but for registered scientists, almost any activity would would do. Um, so this is the Science Council website uh, where you can apply if you are not already a member of a professional body that is licensed to award either CSI or RSI. I guess this is the easiest way to do it because your competence report uh, will serve both as your application for professional regist registration and application for your pro professional membership with the chosen professional body. You literally just need to click a box, uh, I want to join this professional body um, to get registered because you, I didn't say this before, in order to get your professional registration you will need to be a part of a professional body that is uh, licensed to award CSI or RSI. Um, so yeah, this is the easiest way, but you can also go via o ORS directly if you are already a member. They have the same competence report as we do, it's the uh, same standard, so it just it doesn't matter where it was easiest. Um, so completing the competence report is the, the most difficult part, and I, this is the face that I normally get from people when they first see the, the statements uh, of the competence report. I don't know if any of you have seen the, the statement. Yeah. It, did you get that face? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so this is yeah. When you first see it, it's kind of like you get taken aback because you, it's hard to sort of understand what's required, and it's because these statements and these competencies are meant to cover all sciences. So we had to be a bit vague and yet specific at the same time when we. Um, <coughs> design the, these uh, competencies. So there are five areas of competence and we're going to go through all of the five areas and each of those five areas of competence are divided into two or three statements that you, you need to provide an example against. You can use the same examples as long as they apply still to, to different statements. Uh, we normally say that five to ten good examples should take you through all the way through your competence report. So, um, for our side level, um, your examples will have to be very specific or from your day-to-day -day job, a task that you perform to a very high standard, something you're really proud of, um, and just explaining the specifics of what you're doing. For seaside, it's slightly different. So this presentation is more sort of seaside based because uh, ORS uh, have seaside license uh, at the moment, but you are getting our size, so I'll just touch upon that as well. Uh, C size is slightly different. You will have to think in broader terms, and you will be the person who's taking the lead. Um, you have a real sense of context. You know what's happening in the field. You know what's happening in, in the discipline that you're working in. Um, you are aware of the issues. You might be trying to solve them. Um, your examples need to be um, projects rather than specific little tasks that you do. 
um, and you should think of a project in terms of a journey, as cheesy as it sounds. Um, so you have to think about problems, about you know blog solutions that you've uh, uh, come up with, and why did you even do the project in the first place? Will it affect just you know your organisation? Will it, will it affect the broader sector? What was the point of even starting the project? So have all these questions in mind when you are completing your competence report. And obviously you have to be able to offer insight, you know, whilst you're doing your job. You, you need to be thinking about all these things, you know, okay, so what, what, what will this work do? Um, and offer, offer insight. So chartered scientists, they need to think of work sort of broader, in broader terms. Um, and half of the secret in sort of completing your competence report is in the structure of the answer. So people tend to go on tangents sometimes in the competence report. So because you do so much, it's not just one thing that you like one one task that you, that you do all day, every day and non stop. Um, science these days is just so, so cross disciplinary and you do so many other things um, that's sometimes hard to pick an example and just stick to that one example. Uh, without going on you know, some path that leads to another example and then to another example and then to another example. So um, the best thing to do is just, in the first instance, outline what it is that you do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, your, your, your job role, what it is that you do. And then pick, for chartered scientists, pick a project that you worked on. It can be up to five, six years. Uh, back. It doesn't have to be something that you're currently working on. You can go back. Um, then outline what was the, you know, the problem, the situation, the task that you were given, uh, and then go into the specifics or narrow down uh, to the specifics. Uh, so there are usually, we say, three questions that you need to answer in your, when you are completing your competence report. So, what is it that you did? So what was the problem, what was the, what was the task, what was the project, why, why you did it, why you chose specific methods or that specific approach to solving that problem. And uh, the biggest chunk of your answer will be in the how, that's where you put in all the details. Um, so for chartered scientists, I suggest going, uh, there's still way of getting, two ways of getting assessed you've completed your competence report. Was charted, I almost always suggest going for a face-to-face -face because it's easier to explain what you do to the assessors rather than, rather than writing it all down. For registered scientists, it's either way is good. So the other way, obviously, is online uh, assessment where you just have to write everything down. Um, and then again, don't forget to relate the outcome back to practice. So tell us what the outcome of the project or of the task was and then why was why is it important. Um, sometimes the outcome will be so-called failure but there's no such thing as failure when you talk about science, you know, if, if it teaches you a lesson, if it gives you some insight into how you should have done things and it gives you a different approach um, then it's still a success. So don't, don't be afraid to use examples that are considered failures. Um, and in your competence report, uh, everyone, and not everyone, works in teams and you usually have a team, big team of people working on the same thing, but use the word I as much as you can because we want to see your personal contribution, we want to see what you did, uh, because even if you are working within a team, you have a specific thing that you do, even if your colleague next to you is doing exactly the same thing, we want to hear a lot of I, you know, I did this, I worked in this project and I, you know, I noticed that this was going wrong and that that's how I solved it. So don't be afraid to use the word I. Uh, people don't like showing off, people don't like bragging in the conference reports, but if there is one time to brag, that, that's when you do it, when you're completing your competence report. Um, okay, so as I said, five areas of competence. <coughs> Application of knowledge and understanding. This is by far the most complicated, the most technical one uh, that trips people up a lot of the time. So they will start with section A and then they will drop it because it is just... Um, 
So it's all about, as I said, it's all about how you apply your knowledge, your underpinning knowledge uh, in your workplace. Um, I'm going to give you an example. So this is one of the, uh, this is one of the um, statements of CSI competence uh, report. Um, you just can quickly read it, um, and you have, you will always have these little prompts here as well um, to help you sort of direct you in the right, in the right way, in the right, right direction. Um, and I don't know, if, does anyone want to try and uh, give, a, give, give a go at answering this from, your, like, from, from the job that you do? I'm not going to force it's, you, but if you have, it's, yeah. It's difficult. Um, I'm an academic. Yeah. Um, and it's rare I actually get the chance to do any science mm -hmm. nowadays. Um, I have no problems at all giving however many examples you want of leadership. Yeah. Because what I actually do is effectively run teams where the other people are doing the science. That's so it's difficult for me to respond to that when giving examples of actually been reviewing the relevant literature, the manuals of designs, because I have other members of the team that are doing that. <laughs> yeah, but you still know it. Yeah. Yeah. So how yes. do you how do you know it? Um, it it's either because it's report they're, they're reporting back yeah. to me. Yeah. Yeah. Or from yeah. things that I already knew, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. How exactly? Yeah. So you need to explain how you know these things. It might not necessarily be that you read it yourself, but you read a report. You read, you know, someone else tells you, gives you the data, and then you base your uh, research or you know how you lead the team based on that. So don't. Don't be afraid to you know you know use your sort of say yeah my team gave me this report and that's how I know that the way I approach this problem is this way and when you say oh from my previous knowledge if you say that yes this is what pick up on that and they say okay what's the pre you know how did you get your previous knowledge then you know how so think about that underpinning knowledge you can come from <laughs> any way. Um, so if you say, oh, from a, you know, my previous job or something, you will need to expand a little bit and say, so in my previous role, I was doing this. That's how I know that this is the right approach because it works. And it worked in my previous, you know. But yeah. Is there, a word, is there an example you can give that you could say, if you wrote it, if you wrote this, this would not meet the test? Could you give an example of what you shouldn't do? It's it's hard no. to say because it's different every time. Right. Uh, there is no such thing as as a wrong answer, I guess. Even so, I know it sounds like whoa, but just try and think about. As I said, the A section is the most complicated one. That's why I'm starting with this one. We'll, we'll just go rush through the rest. Um, just think about the scientific principles that you use in your job and think of a think of a project. Everyone could think of a project. You are all you look all senior. Uh, so in terms of no I think I understand the challenge you would have as an academic. I mean yeah. as a practitioner, uh, that's yeah. no problem. Yeah. yeah. I can think of all sorts of projects. But yes, I can see how as an but academic. But most most of my most of my team are PhD students. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and if I do it for them, yeah, it's not then their degree. But, yeah. but so most of the thing I do is leadership, is steering, and guidance, and a lot of seasides will yeah. find themselves in that position. They will find themselves being the people, yeah, instructing other people yeah. rather than doing the job but themselves. You, you would demonstrate expertise. Yes. Yeah. Not in, yes. In assessing or but the, the question, but, is, but the expertise there isn't actually science expertise. It's in managerial and leadership and educational expertise. But you, you'd be QAing yeah. their work. To oh yeah, some I've, I've, I've got. So I, I think that's I've got a thesis in my room because I'm doing a PhD viber on Monday. Well, yeah. well, well. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it. Oh, yeah. And but you it's can not use actually me engaging in the experimental design and the testing and things like that, which is what it says. Well, on if the, you've ever done anything like that, have you ever done that? Previously, my PhD was fifteen years ago. Yeah, but you, you you can you can still use examples from from the past, right. and they they will still apply as long as you show that you know what you're talking about. Yeah. that you're not just you know rambling on about something that you've 
I have done it, it's just I haven't done yeah, no, it's it directly fine. for quite some so while. So for the seaside, I, seaside. Would challenge, I would challenge your view that you're not engaging. I would say you are still engaging it if you're still oh, I am, yeah, because I'm, somebody else's yeah. design. Exactly. Yeah. Because you bring the expertise yeah. into it. So I, I would say you were more than qualified to complete Section 8. I would, <laughs> say, I would say you are more than qualified as well. If you, again, you can't run a team, you can't manage a team if you don't know what you're talking about. What you're talking about <laughs> and what the practice of it is. I've known a few managers who run teams that know. Yeah, and that's not a good, that's not <laughs> a good thing, quite is seaside. it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're not quite seaside. <laughs> exactly. Yes, so, <laughs> so you must have that knowledge yeah. and you must know how to apply it. Um, so you said you, you have plenty of practical examples. Yeah. Uh, do you mind sharing one? For just the, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, I often find myself managing teams of business analysts, developers, testers, and I need to make sure that they are following best practice in what they're doing. Uh, so I provide a letter of QA. Um, I'm often involved in the testing, so I can come back and say to them that what they've built and designed is not fit for purpose, and needs to be revisited. Um, we're always, if we're using technology or if there is technology involved, we're comparing with technology guides to see whether that technology is being used in the way the guide is suggesting it's being yeah. used. All of those things. Yes. And, and yes. that's a common occurrence. That's, and that's a good example there. Except that you will need to go into more detail when yeah. you're actually writing it down. So if you're talking about testing something, you will have to say, that's how we test it. Yeah. That's that's right. the process of testing it. You know, we take, you know we do right, take okay. step A, B, C, D. Oh, to, right, yeah. Right. So yeah. how long do you expect so, these answers to be? So um, the, for, for charter, the, if you are going online assessment, they will be quite long because. But uh, as I said, don't 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 make your your lives too difficult. Pick one example, one example, and then narrow it down. And if you mention testing, if you men mention a method that you use, you will have to expand a little bit on the method and in into you know, a bit more technical detail so that the assessors, when they read your competence report, they know that you know what you're talking about. You right. didn't just like cop you know, copy paste something from Google. And uh, so, you, so that's why for size I offer, always suggest going for a face-to-face -face assessment. Right. That way, you will outline the project the problem like you just did you said, oh, I do, t you know, testing, and then now, you yeah. yeah. You will give a few examples of what what that sort of includes. You know, what what what, it, what actual technical uh, testing? Yeah. What steps yeah. do you take? You will briefly outline these things, and then move on to the next question. Um, but if you are going online, you will have to explain. So, say, if you use certain parameters to decide which way is yeah. better, yeah. you'll have to explain what they what they mean. You know, yeah. so. This means that, this means that, and that's how we decide on what approach to take, what method to use. Um, so if, if persons completed this section, thinks they've provided a, a, a significant amount of detail, I mean, it turns out it's perhaps not quite as much, or not written in the way that the assessing people, is the one-to-one -one or the face-to-face -face the opportunity to get that extra detail, so, or provide that extra detail? So you will always get feedback uh, along the way. So once you click submit, even if you chose online assessment, the assessors will have a read and then they will get, if they think there's something missing, if they think there's some details missing, they will come back to you and say, can you expand on this particular thing? They will give you feedback even before they assess you and they, they will tell you, please, can you expand? On, you, you mentioned that you use this method, can you expand a bit more right. on how it works? Right. Uh, so and there is like the normally assessors of the professional body. Yes, like the sound, science council. So science, they are trained by the science council because the standards are ours. So they need to meet. They are all need to be chartered level to assess chartered level scientists. Uh, they are trained by us, but they will be from the professional body. Right. So and they uh, sometimes, well, at least one of the assessors will be from from the professional body. Usually, both of them will be. Um, depending on your discipline, so um, sometimes we will need someone external to, who understands your work a bit better. Yeah. But usually, both of them will be from the same professional body, and they will know what you're talking about. Um, but yeah, even if you choose an online assessment, the assessors are always able to get back to you and say, "Can you please expand? We need more information." Or they will suggest, 
you know what, why don't we just do a face-to-face -face assessment because it will be easier for all of us yeah. uh, when we talk about it. So just because you submit and you think there's something missing, it doesn't mean you're going to get rejected and uh, we'll give you, there's plenty of opportunity to, uh, to sort of, uh, yeah, just modify your answers and stuff like that. Yeah? Good though. You are understanding what, what, what's needed in there though. Uh, the personal responsibility, fairly self-explanatory. Um, this is, I guess this section is a bit easier for people who work in labs, you know, doing lab work because there's loads, loads of health and safety things and stuff, but for operational sort of researchers, so you're all operational, yeah? yeah. Um, other things might apply, so like data protection, maybe it's personal, you know, sharing personal information. So again, you have all these prompts and all these um, policies and protocols. You know how to document relevant aspects of your work, how you carry it out. Are you the one who, you know, if you are CISA, if you are a team leader, how you, how do you make sure that other people in your team follow these pro protocols? How do you make sure that they are complying? what they need to comply with, is it just the case of signing a document and putting it in a, in a drawer somewhere or do you actually make sure that they, you know, follow follow through with all, all these procedures and protocols and if you do then explain how, how you do it. So does any, is it, is anyone involved in data security? Data security, time, yeah. Time yeah. Data security. I thought that might be most relevant to you, to to you guys. Uh, so, how do you make sure that your team sort of complies with the? So, depending on who in the team needs to see the data for the purpose, it, they are um, allocated certain levels of access. Mm -hmm. um, that's vetted by. A separate individual that's not associated with the project team that they it's appropriate for them to see and use that data, and then and then we have other other protocols such as um, are you responsible for? I'm, I often have to use the word I. That's what I'm getting at. <laughs> okay, so I, I have to confirm that they that those processes have been followed. The compliant. So I I'm responsible for ensuring my team's. Yeah. with policies and procedures. And how do you do that? How do you make sure that they... Usually it's a signature on a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which that's stamped. <laughs> but, um, and then, yeah, I, I have to see them. if there's forms being filled out or online or yeah. I have to make sure that the data, that the information they've provided, you know, providing it, is accurate and yeah. true. And, and if it's a misrepresentation, they're, yeah. they're not saying they're doing one thing, they're actually doing something. That kind of queuing it yes, is. that's that's exactly what would go in this section. And say if you notice that someone is uh, not complying, you know, not following yeah. the, the protocols, you know, how do you deal with that as well? Yeah. So again, think about how would you deal with if you notice someone, uh, you know, they have signed a piece of paper but they're not actually yeah. doing what they said they would. Um, but yeah, this is what would go in this section. And for a chartered level. Uh, this is a good answer. You make sure that other people, not just you, you're not just responsible for yourself, but you make sure that others in the team are also complying and you are the one responsible for getting the signatures and getting the, the paperwork and all that. Again, use the word I a bit more often in your... It gets easier as we go, doesn't it? Interpersonal skills, that is fairly easy. I don't know, I find this section probably one of the easiest. I think, I've got, oh yeah, I've got one here as well. Again, demonstrate the ability to communicate effectively with specialist and non-specialist audiences. Uh, so how do you explain something to someone who might still be a professional scientist, but not, a, you're in, not in your discipline? So how would you go explaining uh, what you do to them? Or how would you go explaining what you do to um, I don't know a group of school children, children that might come in and visit or, or our society, or you know, and ask, oh, what, what is it that you do? So, think about times when you had to explain what you do to people who don't necessarily know or understand what you do. 
and how do you um, how do you know that they got it? How do you evaluate? You know, do you get feedback? Do you ask them if they, you know, did you understand? And they say yes. Mm -hmm. Or how? So how do you sort of know that they got the message? And same thing with specialists. So you're talking to a colleague. That's quite simple. Pick an example. Oh yeah, I spoke to my colleague the other day about this particular project that we're working on, and I had a question about something, and. Um, they told me to go and solve the problem this way rather than that way. It is quite simple. This one is quite simple. Um, the, the, um, the communication sort of uh, section, but for, for you, for chartered scientists, uh, the feedback is, I guess, is the uh, important bit. So how, how do you know, if you explain something to a non-specialist, how do you know that they got it? Uh, we might be dealing with a supplier, for example, who don't necessarily know what you need for your, um, for your job, for, for, for the things that you do. How do you explain to them? Uh, you might get, um, I don't know how involved you are with the outside world, with, uh, with I don't know, customers or something. Um, say someone calls you up and asks you a question and you need to explain to them in, in their language. So yeah, it's it's uh, those examples, and I think all of you kind of have have that. You can, if you wanna give me anything um, of, of the, for the section C, you're smiling. Well, you've got something. Okay, there's two things. One, as working in university, we do an awful lot of outreach in schools and things. There's not the <laughs> yeah. way. However many those. <laughs> I want, the, the reason for the smiling was I was just wondering that if I get a I get a group of students who know nothing about what I'm talking about, and and, <laughs> and ten weeks later they pass the exam. Does that count as? <laughs> yeah, that, that that, that's, how, that's how I know what they have and haven't learned. Yeah. It's basically what, what answers I get back in the exams. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, but then again, you would need to explain how you go about explaining what they don't understand. Yeah. Uh, in, yeah, but that's a good example. Yeah, no, they pass an exam. <laughs> that means there's they a, got the there's message. There's a formal assessment yeah. of whether they know what they've learned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that means they got the message. That was yeah. so, the smile. Yeah, no, but absolutely. You can use that example, and that's a good example of dealing with non specialists. Yeah audiences who then eventually you know pass the exam and become specialists so yeah just a bit more detail about how you how you explain it to them and how you go about it simple i mean i know it's not that simple it is challenging but it, it's not as complicated professional practice let me see if i've got yeah professional practice so this is um about mostly about how you manage resources and how you select methods that you're going to use and how you improve. Uh, so you've been using a certain method for a while and then you've realized, you know what, this is, it's, it takes ages, why don't we improve it, like, you know, scrap that and use another method. Or you've been uh, working with a certain um, program, you know, there's been a lot of talk about simulate, simulation pro programs and software and stuff. And now, uh, so say you've been using one of those for a while, and then you reala again realize that you can get one cheaper from another supplier. Um, and it's, so this is about managing projects. And for C sites, it's also about managing resources, making sure that everything runs efficiently, as efficiently as possible and effectively. Uh, and you know, for the best price that you can get. Um, so yeah, again, all of you who are at that level, you will probably be able to think of, of quite a few examples in here. If you want to give me a quick example here, we've got 15 more minutes. All my projects have changed, management projects, effectively, so and they're Sites, mm -hmm. countries, yeah. time zones, and managing that. Is not just that it, it is. It is very more. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, again, just the, you, you would need to just explain how you, how you do it, and just a bit more detail. But it is. You are absolutely right. That that would be a multifaceted project. Um, and it's just explaining how how you how you do it, and if you notice so that something could be done better more efficiently how do you how do you solve that yeah 
Oh, and that's the last section of the um, of the uh, competence report. And across all three levels, uh, across all three registers, there are only two uh, statements in this one, in section E. So the first one is uh, asking about your CPD. So what have you been doing recently for charter? scientists will, will want to hear what you, your plans are for the next year, say. Uh, you know, if you have any conferences planned, if you're planning to go to the, any big events, do any talks, uh, that sort of thing. And the second, uh, the second question in this uh, section is about, um, what is it about? Professional relevant codes of conduct. So if you have to, I guess everyone, when they start a job or start working with sensitive information they will have to sign codes of conduct and then if you are part of OR society you will have to sign their code, code of conduct so you will have you will be asked to sort of name the codes of conduct and practice that you need to uh, follow and comply with um, and just briefly explain why they are important and why it is important to uh, comply with these uh, codes of conduct so again think of any A lot of people tell me that they've signed loads of loads of codes of practice, <laughs> but they're just somewhere in the drawer, so they can't remember. So uh, you will need to dig this stuff out and um, put it in the uh, section E. CPD. Anyone uh, has any plans to do something in the in the future? Any big CPD activity happened in the last last year? I'm co chair of this conference. <laughs> well, brilliant, yeah, absolutely, yes, yes, anyone else? Everything. Things like presenting at conferences yep. would count, yep. and running workshops at, at conferences, yep. and then SIG events, our special interest group events, would contribute towards CPD, and I think that's the, our intention, isn't it, from the yes. art society point of view. Absolutely, so, again, for CSI level, you will need to talk about your future plans as well, Right. You know, I'm gonna. I'm planning to talk at this event to do a workshop. They are pl planning to attend this conference because it's the main conference in the field in the sector that we need, we all you know need to attend. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Uh, and for lower registers, so for RSI, um, it, it as I said, it can be anything. Reading an article and just shadowing someone, learning someone, uh, something from from the colleague. Uh, one person asked me if uh, if I find, found something uh, on Twitter and I clicked on it and it took me to a certain page where I've read something about that was relevant to the research I was doing and then you know it helped me uh, and said would that count? I was like well yeah it's you know so long as you can go back and think about it and explain how how it was you know what why it was beneficial and how it affected you. Um, uh, maybe you did a talk and improved your confidence and communication skills. That's um, that, that 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 counts as well. So yeah, that's it. I think. Oh God, yeah. No. So it, as I said, one of the uh, main points CPD which we just discussed. Um, and I'm going to leave the, these slides here if anyone wants to sort of uh, take a copy. Um, so this is uh, the main sort of pages that we've we've got. So guidance for the three registers. Um, so for you, the most relevant will be the CSI. Uh, it will have all the statements and all the questions from the competence report with all the prompts that you need to answer the uh, statements with, with the right examples. Um, and if you know anyone who might want to go for any of the other registers or not, who's not at our CSI level yet, um, there's guidance book for them as well. And um, our email address, you get stuck with your application, we can always just pull it out from the system and just have a look, have a read, and give you some advice. Um, if you're not, if you're not sure if the answer is quite, you know, fitting in that in that particular section, um, um, again, in your answers, don't be afraid to refer back to a previous example. So say, uh, you know, the example I mentioned in section A, um, a part of that project was this, you know. So you don't. You feel free to use same examples or refer back to examples that you use and sort of expand in the next section. Um, our phone number 
again, I said you know, we were quite friendly at the Science Council, always uh, happy to help. Um, and if, if you are, you know, in the process of doing it and you feel like stuck, don't don't just leave it. Don't just leave it there. Give us a call, drop us an email, and then uh, we'll just guide you through it right there and then, and then you can move on to the next uh, section. And uh, that's it. Good luck Yay. with your application. <laughs>